Hello and welcome to Field Fisher's presentation today on the European Electronic Communications Code. Uh, my name is Phil Lee. I'm a partner in the Privacy, Security and Information team here at Field Fisher. And a very good afternoon or good morning to you, depending on where you are joining us from today. Now, unless you are a, a telecoms nerd, you may not have heard of the European Electronic Communications Code before or be aware of the impacts that it may have uh, it, on the protection of communications data under the uh, uh, under the e-privacy directive in the EU. Um, the European Electronic Communications Code potentially has some significant impacts on the provision of over-the-top messaging services, including where those services are integrated as part of a wider service offering that you may provide. Now that's all very complicated, but fortunately today we are joined by two out and out experts who are here to take you through the EECC and what it may mean for you. We are joined today by our senior associate, Amy Lambert, and solicitor in our team, Alex Beresford. And they are gonna take you through the EECC, explaining what it is, what you need to know and what you need to do in response to it. So with that, I'm going to hand over initially to Alex, who's going to take you through our agenda today and talk you through the early parts of the EECC. So Alex, over to you. Hi everyone, it's lovely to be with you today. So before we dive into the detail, we just want to clearly set out what this webinar is intended to cover. And we'll recap on this at the end. So by the end of today's session, you should be better able to understand and explain what the EECC is, and probably how to say it as well, because it's a bit of a tongue twister, why it's relevant for data protection professionals, the interplay between the EECC and the ePrivacy Directive, the new definitions and who is now caught, how to analyze its application in practice, and what the future holds for the EECC. So starting with the first bullet point, the European Electronic Communications Code, which we'll call the EECC as it's slightly less difficult to say, is a European directive. By way of quick recap, being a directive means it must be transposed into national law rather than a regulation like the GDPR, which has direct effect. Now, this particular directive was adopted in December 2019, but crucially, member states have until the 21st of December 2020 to transpose it, which if you still have any concept of time during this lockdown, it's actually just a few weeks away. And there are many EU member states who have not yet published their draft imp implementing legislation despite this time. And even with Brexit looming, yes, the EU law, EU law does still apply during the Brexit transition, transition period, which means that the UK is not off the hook and is still required to implement the minimum standards within the EECC. Now, the aim of the directive is to modernise the existing EU telecoms regulatory framework. And it does this by repealing and replacing four previous directives, which collectively regulate telecoms in the EU. Now, the focus is on promoting connectivity and encouraging investment in high capacity networks, so things like 5G. And this is considered to be a well overdue update by many, as despite the fast paced developments in the telecom space, the EECC is actually updating an almost 20 year old regulatory framework. So moving on to the next slide, to put it bluntly, apart from Phil's hint at the start of this webinar, you may be wondering why three privacy lawyers are talking to you about a telecoms directive. Well, the EECC broadens the definition of what is considered an electronic communication service, ECS for short, and it includes now some over, -top, over the top services. So these over the top services are things like WhatsApp and Skype, any services relying on software rather than infrastructure. Now, as we know, certain parts of the EU privacy directive apply to service providers, AKA ECS, which previously only expressly covered traditional telecom services and ISPs. Now, Article 2 of the e-privacy directive actually cross-refers to the definition of ECS contained in the previous EU telecoms framework. To deal with this cross-reference, the EECC specifically re requires that any cross-references to the previous framework are construed to refer to the new EECC directive. Therefore, despite this being a telecoms directive, the implementation of the EECC and the change in scope of the ECS definition also means a change in scope of the e-privacy directive. Dun, dun, dun. So the services such as some of the OTTs and other com comms such as machine-to-machine -machine services are now finding themselves caught by the e-privacy directive. 
Now, recital 15 of the EECC explains that the rationale behind this is because end users are increasingly substituting those traditional voice calls and text messages with functionally equivalent online services such as VoIP, messaging services and web-based email services. So the regulatory framework needs to take this into account. On to the next slide. These, cons these changes mean that organisations will need to have a good understanding of the EECC and in particular the definition of ECS to establish whether you fall in scope. Because if you do find yourself now caught, there are some quite onerous provisions of the e-privacy directive which will now apply to you, including a requirement to ensure that content is protected and your system secure, a more onerous 24-hour time period to notify regulators of a breach, and various restrictions on listening and tapping and storing to communi storing communications um, and related traffic data without consent of the user, unless permitted by member state law, of course, and also restrictions on the use of data without consent of users. So this would be for purposes such as marketing or improving your services. We're not going to cover this in any more detail today as we want to focus on getting to grips with the new EECC, but hopefully this gives you an indication of why these changes are so significant and Field Fisher of course are on hand to answer any questions you might have after the webinar. So taking a step back now onto the next slide, we're going to look at the EECC and who it applies to. Well, in general, it applies to both electronic communication networks, ECNs, and electronic communication services, ECS. Now, the first of those, ECN, are not controversial. The definition has not changed under the EECC. So ECNs are essentially any transmitter or transmission system plus associated equipment, software and stored data used to convey electronic signals. So this could be a wired or a wireless network, for example, a network of phone cables or phone mobile phone networks. ECS, however, are slightly more complicated and require us to take a deeper look at the various components of the definition. So moving on to the next slide and taking a closer look, as we've already touched upon, the EECC in Article 2.4 redefines the term electronic communication service, which we'll call ECS for now on. This is done on a functional approach and it's put into three service categories this time. So coming up on the slide now, on the left hand side, you'll see Internet Access Service services. Again, these are already defined and they essentially cover ISPs and anything that allows you to access the internet. On the right hand side of the screen, you have services consisting wholly or mainly in the conveyance of signals. Now, this is essentially the previous test for an e ECS under the old framework. And this is why services such as OTTs were previously so difficult to capture because their services were not considered to consist wholly or mainly in the conveyance of signals on ECN. This category would now cover, for example, transmission services used for the provision of machine to machine services and for broadcasting. So essentially any services not intended for interactive communication between persons. Specifically under the EECC and moving to the middle of this slide, an ECS will now include the subcategory Interpersonal Communication Service, ICS for short. This category now includes a number of activities typically carried out by OTTs whether or not their services consist wholly or mainly in the conveyance of signals on ECNs. Now, ICS, Interpersonal Communication Services, are defined as services that enable interpersonal and interactive exchanges of information. And this includes your traditional voice calls between two individuals, as well as all types of email, um, messaging services and group chats. As before, the ECS still excludes content services. So for example, a shopping portal or an electronic newspaper won't be caught by the definition. So now we've had a look at what's changed. We need to be able to establish whether a service now falls in scope of, IC of an ICS. There are a number of parts which make up the test to meet the definition, and we're going to run through these now. But don't worry if the application of this definition is not immediately care, as my colleague Amy is going to run through some examples. So first we consider whether the platform or the service is normally provided for remuneration. As per recital 16 of the EECC, remuneration includes not just services provided for money, but also services supplied for the provision of personal data or other data if the service provider can extract any value from such data. Now the next question is whether the platform or the service enables interpersonal and interactive exchange of information. 
Interactive communication means that the service allows the recipient of the information to respond. So that's not going to include machine machine communications, for example. Then we look at whether the platform is provided via an electronic communications network. So we've already looked at this definition today. So we're assessing whether the platform or service is provided via a transmission system, which permits the conveyance of signals by wire, radio, optical, or any other electromagnetic means. The next question is, does the communication take in a finite number of persons determined by the sender? Now, recital 17 states that an ICS only covers services between a discrete number of natural persons determined by the sender. The next question on the slide is actually whether the platform is publicly available. Now, this doesn't technically form part of the definition for the test, but it's useful for identifying what requirements in the EECC will apply if the service is an ECS. It's also worth noting that the ePrivacy Directive only applies to a publicly available ECS. So services are considered publicly available if they're not offered to a predetermined group of end users, but could in principle be offered to any customer who wants to subscribe to the service or the network. And then finally, on the last box of the slide there, there is an exception within the definition for falling into scope of what would be considered an ICS. This is if the communication facility is a minor or purely ancillary feature. And we're going to have a little bit, of a, look, a look at this in slightly more detail on the next slide. Because if you look at recital 16, so, sorry, 17, um, this says that in exceptional circumstances, a service can be considered not to be an ICS if the interpersonal and interactive communication facility is a minor or purely ancillary feature to another service and for objective technical reasons cannot be used without that principal service. And its integration is not a means to circumvent the applicability of the rules governing ECS. Recital 17 also explains to us that as elements of an exemption from a definition, the terms minor and purely ancillary should be interpreted narrowly and from an objective end user's perspective. So no surprises there. Furthermore, it says that a feature would be considered minor where its objective utility for an end user is very limited and where it is in reality barely used by end users. Now, Recital 17 does try to help us out by giving an example of a feature that could be considered ancillary, which is a communications channel in online games. But this is actually very dependent on the features of the communications facility of the service. And the exact scope of this exemption does actually need to be interpreted on a case by case basis. Um, and it's also possible that regulators in various member states could take different views. So it is a case of wait and see. But the European Commission has made clear that a mere commercial bundling with other services is definitely not going to suffice to avoid the application of the ICS concept. So moving on to the next slide, we're going to go back to our diagram of the ECS definition. We've had a look at the ICS in general and the various components for falling in scope of the definition. But it's also important to note that ICS are further divided into two categories, depending on whether the communication takes place with or without the use of numbers. So on the left, number-based ICS, these are services that connect to a publicly assigned number resource or that enable communication with numbers. So this would be your traditional phone calls or your VoIP services that enable you to call a traditional telephone number or through which you can be reached on a traditional phone number. And number independent ICS, in contrast, on the right hand side, this is a service that does not connect to a publicly assigned number resource and does not enable communication with numbers. So this would capture, for example, your VoIP to VoIP calls or your messaging like WhatsApp. Now, number independent ICS on the right hand side are subject to less regulation under the EECC due to the fact that number based ICS participate in and hence also benefit from a publicly assured interoperable ecosystem, whilst number independent do not. Additionally, the bulk of any remaining regulations that do apply to number independent ICS primarily, primarily apply to publicly available number independent ICS. So let's pop onto the next slide now. We appreciate that that was a lot of definitions, a lot of law and a lot of tests. So just as a refresher, before I hand over to my colleague Amy to go through some worked examples and to discuss some of the complexities from a data protection standpoint, we have a broadened definition of ECS the electronic communication service. 
this now has three categories and in, in particular the introduction of an ICS, an interpersonal communication service. So these are services which enable interactive and interpersonal exchanges of information. This means that all of the services listed on the slide there are in fact now caught by the definition. So keep those in your mind whilst I hand over to Amy. Amy, over to you. Thank you very much. Hope everyone can hear me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you very much, Alex, for giving us that background into the legals behind the new definition of an ECS under the EECC. Um, as she's just mentioned, it's a lot of law that we've just thrown at you. And, and like anything, the best way to sort of put that understanding into a real world context is just to try and put it into practice and apply it to a particular scenario. So for the next section of this presentation, we're going to take you through three different use cases and try to uh, walk you through the steps that you would have to go through if you were going to apply that test as to whether or not um, a particular service was an ICS and therefore an ECS um, and consider the various complexities along the way. So the first use case that we're going to look at um, today is a sort of start of a 10 fairly easy um, scenario where in our particular use case, we're envisaging a service that allows users to make um, voice calls to each other or send messages to each other through uh, a VoIP to VoIP service. So that would be, for example, somebody who downloads an app and then can use that app to contact other people who have the app via, tele uh, via vo uh, voice call or via message. So as Alex just mentioned, in order for us to try and identify whether this particular service would constitute an ICS, we need to go through um, the test for an ICS. So the first point is, would this service normally be provided for remuneration? Well, in this case, you know, it very well could be. Um, either you could have the app provider um, requiring people to pay for the service, um, but even if that wasn't the case and there wasn't actually a genuine cost for that service in, in a monetary sense, um, again, as Alex mentioned, you know, there can be other value that could be attributed to the use of that, inf uh, of that service. So, for example, personal data um, provision could be the value that's being given there. Um, but in any event, we know that this is one of these examples that the EU was particularly keen to try and capture under the new definition because at its very heart, it's attempting to replace a sort of traditional telephony service. So, by comparison, I think we're pretty comfortable that that is going to be a service that would normally be provided for enumeration, even if in a particular example, we don't necessarily have payment um, for use of the app. The second point is also one that's fairly clear. Does it enable the direct interpersonal interactive exchange of information? Well, yes, absolutely, because the entire purpose of the app is to allow people to communicate with each other. So that's a clear tick. The next one can also be dealt with fairly, fairly swiftly. Um, Alex has already taken us through the definition of an ECN, and we know that the idea of this app is that it works by um, operating on top of the internet. So the internet is the network, and it has the, the ECN component has been satisfied. The next part of the test, does the communication take place between a finite number of persons determined by the sender? Well, yes, again, that's going to be satisfied here because in each case you have any user of the app being able to decide to call or, or message any other user of the app. So again, that's a clear tick. Uh, publicly available. In our example, we would say yes, this is um, publicly available because our example imagines that anybody could go off and um, start to download and use the app. So it's it's you know available for anybody. It's not um, going to be a private network. And then lastly, can we, despite having clicked all these um, ticked all these boxes beforehand, can we try and avail ourselves of the final exemption? Is the communication facility a minor and purely ancillary feature that is intrinsically linked to another service? Well, unfortunately not. No, we can't use that exemption because clearly this entire purpose of the service is to allow um, the communication between individuals. And so it's clearly not going to uh, be able to avail itself of that exemption. In conclusion, we would consider that sort of service likely to be a publicly available numbers independent ICS. So as Alex mentioned, that's the sort of ICS that doesn't rely on numbering resources and therefore is likely to be uh, subject to a fairly light uh, regulatory burden under the EECC. But of course, there can still be the repercussions of the overlay with the ePrivacy Directive. Taking a step back to add some additional complexity, in our next example, what we have here is a, a banking app 
that is made avail available to customers who are customers of that particular bank. Uh, they can log on to the app in order to um, manage their money, transfer funds, and also as part of this app functionality to communicate with the, um, the banking provider to ask questions about how um, the app is used or how they can actually manage their money. So this is the, the new scenario that we're going to go through using exactly the same test. So would this service normally be provided for remuneration? Well, again, you know, it's unclear at this point whether or not um, customers are actually required to pay to um, access this app. But it's probably fair to say that, again, the entire service is part of the general banking service that's provided to individuals. So there is likely to be some value that is being given to the um, service provider by virtue of providing this app, even if it's just in terms of, for example, increased customer loyalty to the general banking um, functionality that they provide. So that would be a tick. Does this um, app allow the direct interpersonal interactive exchange of information? Well, yes, of course it does also, because in our scenario, we're envisaging that um, banking customers can communicate directly with their bank through the app, send messages, receive messages back about um, the different queries they might have about the app. So that's a tick. And again, it's, it's an app, so it's provided over the internet. So again, we would say that this is going to be clearly provided via an ICN, that condition is met. The next one is a little bit more interesting because the test is, does the communication take place between a finite number of persons determined by the sender? Now, in this example, arguably on a, technica, on a technical point, this um, particular ground might not actually be satisfied because here we have um, the banking app is the one who has already predetermined who is going to be able to communicate on that app. Or put another way, the only people who can use it are banking customers and they can only use it to communicate with the bank itself or employees at the bank, uh, whoever's manning the customer services desk, for example, on behalf of that particular service provider, the bank. Um, so in this particular case, we could consider that the end user who is the customer cannot decide who is actually going to receive the communication. They can only send that communication to the bank. So arguably it isn't determined by the sender and it arguably doesn't satisfy that criteria. Um, the next point, whether it's publicly available, again, this could be slightly more controversial because you could say, uh, for example, that this is only provided to banking app users and members of the bank. So again, it's not something that can be just generally picked up by anybody. You have to already be part of this particular category, which is the, the banking um, banking customer. And on top of that, if you look at it from the perspective of the end user, it's not the case that you can then use this app or this um, discussion, uh, the communication facility part of the app to communicate, as I mentioned earlier, with anybody other than the bank. So again, you know, arguably it's not publicly available. It's just a kind of private communication um, within the banking um, community. Um, and in any event, even if we weren't as convincing as we could have been on those last two points, although I, I think we've got some pretty strong arguments to say that that's unlikely to be the sort of service that's going to satisfy those particular conditions, we can also look at this exemption uh, about whether or not the communic uh, communication facility is a minor and purely, purely ancillary feature. And in this case, we could say, well, we think it probably is because the primary focus of the app is to allow the banking customer to um, use their banking functionality to you know, put their money in, transfer money around, etc. The additional element to allow communication with the bank internally is actually something that is, is not really the primary focus of it. It wouldn't exist without the app at least in our example, um, without the, exact, the app already existing for these other purposes. And really, you know, it, it could be removed if it had to be um, without really resulting in a, in a massive um, detriment to the general app. Um, and to sort of add weight to this suggestion that this is the sort of scenario where you could rely on this particular exemption, there was a progress report from the Council of the European Union back in 2017, where they were trying to clarify some of the definitions in the EECC, in particular, where you could actually avail yourself of this ancillary feature. And in that particular progress report, the presidency did state that they thought that a banking app for managing bank accounts and payments would not be in scope if it also includes a communication service between the bank customer and a bank representative. But of course, in order for that to actually work, we still have to be able to rely on a fairly 
strong um, argument that the principal purpose of the software is is to do something other than provide communication. So again, as Alex mentioned, this does need to be a case by case example um, to make sure that on the facts as they apply in, in the relevant scenario, this is still the case. But for the purposes of our example, we are comfortable that this would be um, a minor and purely ancillary feature. And as a result, we would probably say that this particular service is outside the scope of the EECC. It doesn't um, count as an ICS, it isn't an ECS, and therefore we don't have to worry about any e-privacy overlay, which is good news for the service provider. Now, the last um, example that we're gonna go through is even more complex than the last one. So please do bear with me, it, it, it's a little bit mind boggling. But in this particular example, we are going to imagine that we are advising the client on the far left hand side, who is a business that provides services to other business customers, such as the customer in the center. Um, and that service is to allow the business customer to integrate into their own um, websites or mobile apps, a chat functionality that allows end users and those would be, for example, browsers or customers of the middle business um, customer to communicate with the business customer via uh, the chat functionality that's been integrated into their website or their app. So for the purposes of our um, use case, we are going to imagine that the integrated chat function on these websites or apps um, is white labeled. You know, from the end user's perspective, they will be um, communicating, they think, directly with the um, the business customer's web, uh, whose website or app they visited, and they're not going to be aware of our, our client who sits behind the scenes, who's actually responsible for providing that functionality. But we've been asked to advise our client. So what we need to do in that case is to actually have a look at this chain. Um, and in slight contrast to the last two examples, what we need to do is almost break it down into two stages. Um, the first stage is what is the service that is being provided directly by our, our, our client to their business customer. So that's the first sort of red circle loop. And then secondly, we need to further think about the service that's being provided by the business customer to the end user. So if we start with the first um, part of this particular use case, um, the service being provided by our client, the business to their business customer, we can then go through the same test again. So is this going to be normally provided uh, provided for remuneration? Well, yes, our, our client sells this service to its business customers, so there's clearly going to be payment there. Um, does it enable the direct interpersonal interactive exchange of information? Well, yes, it does, because we know that although we're just looking at the scope of the service that we provide directly to our business customer, uh, we still know that the interactivity that we're providing will allow people to communicate through that service. So we're still expecting it to be used um, for a communications purpose that will allow the direct interpersonal and interactive exchange of information. So that's a tick. Again, a quick tick, it's, it's still, we're still thinking about a sort of SaaS-based product here. So it's still sat on the internet, still going to be uh, provided via an ECN. And the next point is whether or not the communication takes place between a finite number of persons determined by the sender. Well, in our case, we would think that probably is satisfied because we know that the um, the business customer is the one who is determining who, from our perspective, will be using the, the service. So they're, the business customer is our sender and they're responsible for who is going to be able to use this. So they are still making that determination themselves. That's going to be a tick. Um, the next one publicly available, again, we, we in our example, we would say this is the case because our example envisages a sort of off the shelf um, standard service that we can provide to any business customer. But there could be some additional complexity here. So, for example, if we allowed a very high degree of customization about how our business customers could actually amend or tweak um, the particular functionality that we're making available to them, there could be an, uh, an argument that that wasn't publicly available because it wouldn't be the sort of product that everybody else could get um, due to that high degree of um, customization. But in our case, we're going to say yes, it is public available because it's just a, a non-bespoke service that anyone can purchase and unfortunately for our client we don't think that this communication facility is going to constitute a minor and purely ancillary feature because we know that the entire purpose of the product is to allow the integration of this communication facility so in actual fact you know that this is just the entire purpose of the service it can't um, benefit from this this particular exemption so when we look at that service, just in the in the first instance, our client to the business customer, uh, we would uh, 
we would probably conclude that this is a publicly available numbers independent ICS. Again, there's no numbering resources used here. It's you know it's a it's an entirely numbers independent um, service. The second part of this um, analysis will then be to have to look at how this works from the perspective of the business customer to the end user. And the reason for that is because it harks back to the earlier test that I think Alex mentioned earlier on, which was um, under the old law, part of the way in which you would be able to identify whether there was an ECS would be to consider from the perspective of the ultimate end user. So here it would be any visitor to the app or the website, um, what who they think is providing the service. So in our particular example, as I mentioned, this is a white labeled service that is fully integrated into our business client's um, website or app. So from the end user's perspective, they've got no idea that we're sitting behind the scenes uh, and they would purely think that any functionality or, or chat um, availability that was made available to them was provided to them directly by the business customer. So we need to go through that test again to see whether or not from the perspective of our business customer, they are also providing an ECS uh, and the reasons that I'll go into in a little bit more detail. So again, normally provided for enumeration, um, we'll, we're going to say yes, it can either be, uh, as we've gone through before, payment in for money or it could just be other values such as the personal data aspect or the, for example, um, customer loyalty improvements just by virtue of having a better um, better functionality on your website or your app to allow interactive communications between yourself and your customer. The next one is also ticked because, as I just mentioned, the purpose of this functionality is to allow that chat function between end users um, who are likely to be your customers or browsers or potential customers to speak to the business um, client. Again, easily it's going to be an ECN, it's on the internet, so that's, that's fine, that's ticked. Um, similarly to the last example, we could also make the argument here for the same reason that actually this, this particular um, condition is not satisfied because in the same way to the banking app situation, um, the sender here is going to be the end user and they can only use that functionality, that chat functionality to communicate with the business customer and the business customer's employees or whoever has been employed by the um, business customer to respond and manage that chat function. So they aren't able, for example, to go onto the website or the app and use that chat functionality to speak to anybody else other than the business customer. So we could say, again, that there is an argument here that actually that is not going to be satisfied because the communication is not determined by the sender. And similarly, from the, the previous example, arguably this isn't publicly available um, because, again, it only allows communication to the business um, customer and not to the world at large. So it is a kind of a private communications network just within that particular ecosystem. However, we can't then use our get out of jail free card um, to see whether or not this exemption will apply here because for the same reasons before, the communication functionality is this integrated chat function that's put onto the website or the app is, is the pure reason that this service is provided. It's not an ancillary feature. Um, and so we can't avail ourselves of that particular exemption in this case. But because of those um, two other conditions, we would still conclude that either we've got a good argument that this particular element of the service is not to be considered uh, an ICS and that's because of the technicality about the determination of by the sender or if that argument fell down uh, we would still say well in any event it's a private numbers independent ICS and that still gets us a, a fair way in, in essentially not really requiring our business customer to do a lot of um, to comply with the law because as Alex mentioned, for example, the e-privacy requirements only apply to a publicly available numbers independent ICS. So actually, from the perspective of our business customer, they don't have to worry too much about additional regulation on, when it comes to the element of the service that they're providing to the end user. And that's important for from our perspective, even though we're advising our business client and not their business customer. And that's because when we end up trying to advise our business client, we still have to take into account the entire chain in order to tell our business client uh, what it is that they need to be aware of and you know, trying to propose some strategies for dealing with these issues. So, for example, if we click back through the test that we went through for the first use case, we came to the conclusion that our business client is already going to be um, providing a um, public numbers independent ICS. Now, what that means is that under the e-privacy law, 
we're going to have some issues if we want to do things that perhaps we previously thought we could do, um, for example, in relation to content of communications data and then in relation to um, metadata around content of communications data. And that's because as in um, publicly available uh, numbers independent ICS, we are suddenly bound under this new definition under the EECC to the same requirements in the e-privacy directive that stop um, service providers being able to use that information unless you can satisfy specific grounds. And now normally, you know, under in the old world, I should say before the 21st of December, it would be very common for um, business businesses like our business client to want to use content of communications data or metadata for purposes such as to improve their own products and their services and they might do that in their own capacity in relation to just improving their product generally as they go out and send, sell it to the, to the market but similarly you might find that you're appointed under a particular contract with a business customer to actually improve the service as a processor using some of the content that the business customer makes available to you as a processor for the purposes of improving that service for the business customer. So all of a sudden, even though our business customer is not restricted under e-privacy and can suck up and use the content of communications data and metadata for the purposes that it wants to, so for example, to improve its own service offering as it provides it to the end user, we are still restricted from being able to actually do that because we are still, as an, EC, uh, as an ECR, restricted generally. Um, and where that essentially leaves us is we would need to, at this point, advise our client that a it's an incredibly complicated um, route of um, analysis that you have to go down but b you know we need to take a step back and say well, what kind of information are you actually tending to use or do you want to use or are you instructed to use and for what purposes because depending on how you use that content or how you need to use that content we're now going to have to think of some clever um, strat strategies for positioning this so that we've got everything that we need to ensure that we're not inadvertently um, wandering into interception laws under local law. So sorry that that was a bit of a, a dash through that, but um, I hope that shows you exactly how complicated this can be because we end up in a position where as privacy professionals, we have to get to grips with some of the telco law uh, and some of the telco law definitions. We then have to break down, um, you know, fairly complex scenarios that might involve fairly complex uses of different technologies in specific use cases to try and apply these new definitions to that, that data flow and then take a step back and say, okay, well, if we've come to the conclusion that we are now um, an ICS under the EECC, we are going to have these um, you know, uh, now we're going to be subject to these additional obligations under the e-privacy directive. And that could lead us into a new environment where all of a sudden, in order to do what we were doing yesterday, we now need to be aware of um, local interception laws uh, in order to allow us to continue to provide the product that we had been providing before this date. So it can be quite quite a bit to get your head around and quite a lot of analysis. But just to conclude for this um, particular scenario, so we've we've come to the conclusion that for our business client, they are a numbers independent ICS, and they're going to have to also think about the potential customer flowdowns that they might need to require their customer to do as a matter of contract in order for them to continue to provide the service that the customer has taken from them. So that was quite a lot of uh, <laughs> running you through some different examples and trying to. Um, you know, analyze how that would work in practice. But I think it is still worth bearing in mind that, of course, you know, as Alex already mentioned, um, this isn't in, in play quite yet. You know, the, the transposition deadline is the 21st of December 2020. And of course, what we've got in the EECC at the moment is very much a, a general framework. Um, so we need to see from that date, 21st of December onwards, exactly how the EECC is going to be, um, you know, uh, implemented in local member states um, and that's you know it's quite interesting to see already you know how that is is being um, approached by different governments so of course in the UK we've, we've already got the Brexit issue which makes life more complicated just generally but one of the interesting things that we've seen as a result of Brexit um, is that the UK has decided to take a sort of slightly different approach to the EECC now, part of the reason of that is to do with um, COVID, which again could you know, apply equally across various different countries where they've essentially said, look, you know, COVID has made it difficult for everything and for everyone. So we're going to have to um, prioritise certain things and certain and, and deprioritise 
um, other things because we just don't have the bandwidth to deal with all of this right now and we've got to focus on where we're going to have the biggest impact and so they sort of flagged that nationwide gigabit connectivity is their, is their key thing at the moment and that's not necessarily something for us to worry about because that's going back into the telco regime but the other thing that they mentioned as well was that as a result of Brexit, a lot of the EECC or some of the EECC requirements are the sort of requirements that are ultimately going to require European member states to work together on certain um, functionality pieces over time. And of course, you know, the transition period is going to end on the 31st of December, which essentially leaves us with 10 days where we are going to be both in scope for the EECC and technically still required to um, to, to, to work with the EU in the way that the EECC would require us to do so. And the UK government has just said, look, there's no point us spending the time or effort trying to deal with those pieces because our day, 10 days are up, they're no longer going to apply to us. So we're just not going to focus on that sort of stuff now um, and we're going to, to push it to one side. And then the last area that the UK government has also um, highlighted that they're not going to focus on too much is the regulation of numbers independent ICS. And that's why we kept trying to stress throughout this um, presentation the distinction under the overall category of an ICS into a numbers independent or numbers based. Um, because numbers independent already has a fairly um, more light touch approach than numbers based. And the UK government has said here as well, you know, again, this is quite a complex um, complex area of law. It's going to involve several government departments to get their head around how this is supposed to work in practice. And as a result, given that um, at the moment, even under the EECC, numbers independent ICS services are principally due to EU instigated interoperability, consumer protection and light touch regulation. The government says we're, we're just not going to worry about trying to impose um, the specific provisions that apply to numbers independent ICS as critical for the December deadline. So what we might find in practice is that, you know, despite the fact that there is this additional complexity and there could be some you know, strict legal ramifications to this new um, setup, because the government has already indicated that they're not particularly interested in numbers independent, at least in the UK, you know, that could be indicative of the fact that actually there's not going to be an immediate rush to try and um, look into how this would work in practice and to start taking action against um, businesses that might now be in scope when they weren't previously, um, at least in the short term. I mean, the only caveat to give there is that, unfortunately, what we, we still need to keep our eye, eyes out for is that even if the UK government decides not to um, transpose or, or prioritise the numbers independent um, requirements under the EECC, uh, we'll still need to see exactly what they do implement because if they don't do it carefully, what we could find is services that would have been previously subject to a lighter touch re regime as um, numbers independent ICS might still be categorised in such a way that they would constitute an ECS but might not have the um, the carve outs that they would have been given if, if we had all the specific terms that applied to numbers independent. So we've got to be hopeful and keep an eye out that we don't inadvertently end up in a situation where uh, businesses that should have been subject to light touch end up being subject to um, more more regulation than they should have been just because the UK government thought they could avoid it by not um, not imposing it at all. So one to watch there. Um, but equally, you know, the same rule applies for other member states. We just don't know exactly how they are going to view enforcement priorities in this particular area. As you've already seen, it's incredibly complex. Um, I can't see anybody jumping out of there, um, you know, jumping to, to to get onto companies um, for non-compliance of this particular area of the law, particularly if they fall into this numbers independent category. Um, you know, the, the big players are, are, you know, it's always going to be something they should be aware of because they're going to be the, the, the people that, you know, the regulators go for first. But in any event, it's, it seems to be unlikely that this is going to be a regulatory priority from, from the get-go, but it's certainly one to watch. And then if we move on to my next slide, Looking into the future, um, just some other <laughs> things to bear in mind that add to the future complexity. Um, what we have at the moment um, is, as we know, a situation where from the 21st of December, the definition of an ECS is going to be expanded to include an ICS, which could also be, you know, capture a lot of these OTT providers. And what that meant was that there was a recognition um, from the EU that actually you know, at the moment, there are quite a few numbers independent um, ICSs, specific technologies to detect um, child sexual abuse on their services and to report that to law enforcement authorities and organisations acting in the public interest to prevent child sexual abuse and to remove that material. Now, the, the EU you know, registered that actually as of the 21st of December, these sorts of services could be in scope for, um, for an 
ICS and therefore they're going to be uh, in line with the e-privacy directive or subject to the e-privacy directive, sorry. And that means that they're suddenly uh, prevented from being able to do this because they will no longer be able to um, review or monitor content of communications either automatically or in person to look out for these sorts of flags of, of, um, of sexual abuse. So this is one particular area where the EU has acknowledged that there's going to be additional complexity here, which might not always be beneficial to the public or, or the public good. So in this particular example, um, the EU did decide to adopt a, um, a, a proposed regulation to essentially allow a NUMS independent uh, ICS to continue to do this for this particular purpose. Um, so the idea here is that this, this new regulation should apply until the December 2025, um, or it can stop earlier if there's you know, a new law in the meantime that's adopted to allow this you know, particular exemption under the um, e-privacy directive. But there is a recognition there, I think, that it's keeping an eye on this, and there is, there is recognition that there is additional complications that need to be addressed. Um, the other thing to bear in mind, of course, is the, the fated e-privacy regulation, which we've been waiting for for, for quite a long time now. Um, you know, that could also change the situation because, of course, that's going to repeal and replace the e-privacy directive. Um, and that will, again, change the, the landscape in which um, these OTTs who are now ICS and now subject to e-privacy law will have to operate in. So it's worth keeping an eye on that, as I'm sure we all already are. Um, you know, proposed suggestions in one of the earlier drafts was that there might be a, a relaxing of the grounds in which you can use content of communication and traffic data. Um, so, for example, you might be able to use that for legitimate interest purposes rather than um, consent. But, you know, that that still doesn't see uh, getting any ground. And we've seen, you know, there was recently that um, released version of the German presidency take on the e-privacy regulation and that's gone back to this idea of consent so again you know we're ping-ponging between different views but it does still seem that the over, overarching view is that there's going to be um, consent restrictions that will still apply even under the new law but we'll have to wait and see and then of course the Brexit issue again which is that by this point um, the UK will be out of the transition period and therefore no longer required to comply with EU level law so even if the e-privacy uh, e regulation does get itself sorted out and we do get that passed um it, you know it's, it's it's almost impossible to i think that that's going to happen before the end of the year and therefore it's not going to be automatically binding on the uk in any event and that could be the first example of a clear difference between how the uk starts to deal with these sorts of issues versus the rest of the eu so we'll have to wait and see as well you know what happens at that point and, and what view the uk decides to take um in relation to any e privacy regulation that comes out so I think with that, I will pass back over to my colleague, Alex, just to sum up. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, thank you so much for sticking with us. We know it's not an easy topic to follow and we'll be on hand, obviously, to answer any queries. But for now, you should be better able to understand and explain what the EEC is. So remembering that it's a directive with an upcoming deadline to transpose into local law, why it's relevant for data protection professionals, despite being a telco directive, and the fact that it impacts on the scope of the e-privacy directive. The interplay between the EECC and the e-privacy directive, bearing in mind the cross-reference of the ECS definition. The new definitions and who is caught, so particularly we looked at the concept of an ICS and the test for falling in scope how to analyze its application in practice. And we hope that you can draw on some of Amy's helpful examples as a starter for 10, if you're listening to this and considering whether or not you might now be caught and what the future holds as when we add anything like differing member state implementation, Brexit, COVID, and a long awaited uh, e-privacy regulation into the mix. We're certainly kept on our toes and we still need to follow the EECC even after the 21st of December deadline. So Phil, I'll pass it back over to you to see if there's any questions come in. That's great. Thanks. Thanks very much to you both. That is an enormously complicated uh, subject. And as you were both speaking and giving a very comprehensive uh, overview there, I was just taking a few notes myself to try and think, you know, as a privacy professional, what is it that I sort of really need to try and understand from all of this? And I think it boils down to a few things. What we can take away from um, everything you've presented is that we have this EECC which is coming into effect on the 21st of December this year. We know that as in doing that it's going to broaden the scope of what we consider to be an electronic communication service and that's important because 
electronic communication services, if they're publicly available, are regulated by the uh, e-privacy directive. And from the broadening of the scope that we've seen, we can see from that the, um, the over-the-top services, so those kind of um, internet-based messaging services are going to be within the scope of the e-privacy directive going forward. And we can also see that messaging functionality that is integrated within websites or apps may be brought within scope if it meets all the elements of the, the test that Amy ran through earlier on. And one of the really critical points there seems to be whether that messaging functionality is purely an ancillary feature to the wider service. So you can imagine, for example, that if, if you are an online service provider with chat or voice functionality integrated into your service, you'll be looking pretty closely at that definition. And then the, the issue then becomes, well, if it's subject to the privacy directive, what are the consequences of that? Well, Alex explained that earlier on. She explained that there are certain security requirements under the privacy directive, there are breach reporting requirements under the privacy directive, and there are restrictions around accessing uh, messaging content or metadata, or as the e-privacy director calls it, traffic data. And unless you are using that data purely for the delivery or billing of a service, then typically you need consent in order to use that data. So all of those kind of funky things you might do about screening content for machine learning or AI or product improvement or maybe monitoring communications on your platform, suddenly you have a question mark hanging over you as to whether or not you need consent for those things. So, so uh, uh, certainly a lot to chew through there. Um, we have had a couple of questions come in and we've just got a little bit of time to answer them. Uh, Alex, I think the first one is for you and it's to do with the, the breach reporting requirements under the e-privacy directive. So you mentioned earlier on that um, where you have a service which is an ECS and within the scope of the e-privacy directive, there is a, a 24 hour breach reporting requirement but of course, there is already a breach reporting requirement under the GDPR, and the general expectation there is reporting breach within 72 hours. How do those two things fit together? Yeah, sure. So the e-privacy directive, um, the way it works, it complements and sort of particularizes the GDPR. So where the e-privacy directive makes a provision um, that's already in GP GDPR more specific, then the specific provision in the e-privacy directive takes precedence over the general provision in the GDPR. So here it means that the 24-hour reporting period is going to take priority over the 72-hour um, period. Um, and it's a great example to demonstrate why the EECC coming into force is so important, because if you're now caught by the broadened definition, your reporting um, your breach reporting window is actually just reduced by 48 hours so it's quite significant okay yeah that is that is quite a significant impact um amy i've got a question for you here as well which concerns uh, access to content of communication so what are the what are the conditions when an ecs is able to access the content of a communication sent through its service Thanks. So, I mean, that's <laughs> that's a really complicated question in itself, to be honest, because where that um, the, the route that that takes us down is essentially looking into interception laws under local law in the various member states. So, as we know, you know, the starting point is that um, under the e privacy directive, you can't con uh, can't access the content of communications for the keep it secure. Um, if we were then to look at, for example, in the UK, um, the relevant bits of law that we would have to look at from that perspective would be, for example, um, the, um, the IPA, Investigatory Powers Act um, in the UK. Uh, and also we've got a, a subset of regulations, which are kind of colloquially known as the um, monitoring and record keeping regulations. And between the two of them, they set out the different tests that would apply depending on whether you can be considered to be the um, systems operator of the relevant system that is collecting this communications data, uh, or whether you've been authorised on behalf of the, um, the systems operator. Um, and there are some you know, fairly standard examples that those of us in the UK will, will not be surprised to hear. So, for example, you quite frequently hear, at least in the UK, if you were calling up a customer hotline, some sort of message that says, you know, please be aware that this call is being recorded for um, monitoring and improvement purposes. And that's because one of the exemptions that is allowed in the UK is if you are the um, systems operator, you can um, 
collect and review the content of communications if you are doing so in order to, for example, keep records um, of activities that are pertinent for the business, or if you're trying to protect the security of the system, um, or if you're, you're doing it for sort of checking that whoever you've, you've used, uh, who you've sorry, authorised to use the system is, is doing so appropriately in accordance with the, the setup that you've asked them to, to use. Um, so those are the sorts of grounds that you could potentially rely on as a um, systems operator, but you still have to have taken all reasonable steps to have informed everybody who's on the call that you're going to be using that content. So that's why you would normally see, for example, that recorded message that will give you that um, indication that A, the message is being recorded and B, why. And of course, we would also be recommending at that point that anybody who's trying to rely on that would then also signpost to the privacy notice, where again, you know, this is still going to be personal data. So you, of course, still need to make sure that that's covered in your privacy notice and you've got all the relevant bits of, of detail there to, to go into more information about that as well. Um, but there are, those grounds are actually quite restrictive. Um, it doesn't necessarily give you everything that you would potentially need. Um, and in some situations, you might find, for example, like our um, use case three, where we've got almost like a three stage process um, that one particular entity. So in our use case, it would be um, our business client. You know, they want to be able to use the content of communications data for various purposes like product improvement, um, but they're not necessarily the right party um, to be placed to be uh, notifying the end user about this use of information. Um, and so you have to, that's the sort of flow down, for example, from a UK perspective that you might want to ask your business customer to do to make sure that you've got what you need to allow you to use that content. So you could um, include in your contract, you know, a requirement that the business customer makes everyone available that that content is, um, makes, sorry, makes everyone aware that that content is going to be recorded for specific purposes. Um, and then, you know, that you're clearly instructed as a processor to use that content for the purposes that the business customer had previously um, notified to individuals. Um, separately, you know, you might be able to um, also um, avail yourself of a sort of, again, it's like a telco reg um, exemption where you can use that content of communications data in your own right for the security of the service. So in our example, with, with our business client, you know, there, if there's an argument that we need certain um, content of communications or certain metadata in order to actually ensure the security of the service from our perspective as provider of that ultimate service, then again, that's something that we might be able to do. But it really, you know, it, it requires firstly, not only that test to work out whether or not you are an ECS and to what extent, but also you need to have a bit of a deep dive into exactly what data is being collected and why, in what capacity are you using it and why. Um, and then you need to think about, you know, what is the local law that applies to you? Because the, the, the test or the considerations that I just walked us through are very much UK specific um, and you can have you know, very different situations under local law in different jurisdictions. So I, I, su I suppose the, the short answer to all of that is that if you don't have consent from both parties uh, and you don't fall within the, the interim regulation you meant earlier on against preventing child sexual abuse, then it's going to be a very long and complicated investigation to find out what local law requires. Exactly. <laughs> so come okay. to us, we can help. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. All right. Well, listen, uh, we are coming up on the close of the hour. Um, it, for anybody who's been attending today, if you do have other questions that um, you uh, around this, please feel free to message those in. Any questions we haven't had time to get to today, we will uh, follow up on email and respond to those questions. We will also uh, circulate a copy of this recording for anybody who wants to kind of re-listen in and get their heads around some of the complexity of all of this in their own time. Uh, otherwise, uh, I, I just want to say thank you to Amy and Alex who have taken us through an undoubtedly complex piece of legislation and to everybody for attending today. And with that, we will wish you uh, farewell. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.